Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Free Radicals. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing the first couple of rounds today. Now, before we move on, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support this channel and gain access to some pretty great perks, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. Uh, people who support the channel through there gain access to things like my exclusive opinions episodes, where I talk a lot about all the games that I'm playing, and they also also get access to some videos early and advertisement free. The final thing I'd like to ask is that if while you're watching this, you see a turn that could have gone differently, or if maybe some part of the game really jumps out to you, then please comment down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our four different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I am showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, this is set in the future, and it is several years after some alien technology mysteriously arrived on the Earth. We called it Free Radicals, and that technology has allowed us to produce nearly infinite energy, food, as well as resources, turning Earth into a utopia. Now, this game takes place in a metropolis that was built up around one specific spherical free radical. Within this metropolis, each player is going to be controlling a specific faction, and each one of these factions play drastically different from the other. For example, this player over here has programming mechanics, whereas this player over here has a domino minigame on their board. Now, this game comes with 10 different factions that each play completely differently, and today we're going to be playing with four out of those 10, and then near the end of the tutorial, I will give an overview for the other six. As you can see, there are five of these boards, and there are two of these factions on each board. Now, the goal for every faction is to have the most points once the game is over, and that happens once we've completed 12 full rounds. Now, the way we get points is going to be different for each faction, but there are some similarities. For example, there are these 10 different buildings in the middle of the board, and all players have an ability to awaken these buildings, which unlocks them, and then any player can visit those buildings to gain their benefits. In addition to that, all factions, including non-player factions, will have the ability to increase their knowledge of the free radicals, and it is often a good idea for one player to increase the knowledge of another player, which will help both of those players out. The last thing to mention in this overview is the fact that every player has a bunch of these favor cubes, and many things that you do in this game involve giving your favor cubes to an opponent, and at the end of the game, players will get points for the number of sets of different player cubes that they have. So, as we play through the game, there are several ways in which players are incentivized to help each other out, even though this is a completely competitive game, and while this was a very high-level overview of how the game works, don't worry, I will go into all of the details while we are playing the game. Well, on that note, let's now start playing the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to be playing as the Paladin player over here, but again, don't worry, I'll explain the details of how each one of these other factions work when it is their turns. Now, we are the starting player, and we pick that randomly. And then, in order to mark that we are the starting player, we put one of our favor cubes over here on the round track. That means at the start of every one of our turns, we are going to push this forward. So that means our token is the round tracker for the game. Now, we don't move this forward in the first round of the game, but we will at the start of every one of our future turns. So let's focus back over here, and let's begin our first turn of the game by talking a little bit about us as the Paladins. Now, this faction is all about ensuring that the free radical technology is used for the greater good. Specifically, the Neon Paladins began as a charitable cosplay community based on a classic video show, but now they're the world's largest humanitarian organization. Now, as the Paladins, we have five knights and squires that we are going to send out to do a variety of specific actions, and I'll explain how that works very soon. Now, let's move over here, because on every player's turn, they are going to go through every single step that's listed on their faction board. The number of steps will differ from one faction to the next, and every faction's first step is called Prestige. The way this step works is quite simple. If at this moment we had the singular prestige token, we would then gain one victory point. And obviously holding onto this is good because getting a point at the start of each turn is great, but there are ways for this to move around and I'll talk about how that works later on. After that, we can move into the second step of our turn, and this is called progress. Now, the rest of these steps are specific just to the paladins. Again, I'll explain the details of the other steps for our opponents when we get to their turns. For the progress step, it says we have to move the activation cube one space to the right. So let's glance down here, and we placed a favor token down onto the start space at the beginning of the game, so we can move this once to the right, and then we will perform the specific action that's listed there. 
As you can see, this track has 12 different spots on it, and we're going to move this once per turn in this 12-turn game. Now, on this turn, it says place, so what that means is we are going to place every single one of our knight or squire tokens out onto our board to perform actions, and on our next turn, when we slide this over to remove, we will then remove those tokens and place them back over here, but then specifically only activate the locations that have the knight token on them. So let's focus out and now start the third step of our turn, which is called actions. Now, again, if we are on the place spot, then for the action turn, we have to take each one of these tokens and place them out onto one of these locations and then perform one of the actions as listed there. So we get five things that we can do, and the activation doesn't matter if it's a knight or a squire. As you can see, the squires don't have a helmet on them, but once we perform all five of these actions on our turn, these are going to dictate what we're going to get on our next turn of the game. Again, once we go here, we will remove each one of these and when we remove a knight we will get to perform that action again so what this means is on our first turn of the game we're going to get to do five things and on our second turn of the game we will only do one thing and it'll be the spot where we placed our knight on the first turn of the game so we have to think a little bit ahead and obviously our first turn is going to be much better than our second turn but on the second turn we will also upgrade a squire into a knight so that when we go into the next set when we remove we will get a couple of actions so as we go deeper into the game our removal move actions will get stronger and again every other turn we essentially have to figure out what's going to be good for us to do on the next turn of the game so this is essentially an action programming puzzle and let's now figure out what actions we want to do in this case, I think let's start by placing a squire, and we'll go right over here. Once again, the difference between placing the squire and the knight right now is that this will not activate again on our next turn. But we do get to do this right now, and this says we can draw any data card, and we can take one favor of our choice. Let's start by drawing a data card. And with that in mind, we can focus up here on the Metropolis board. As you can see, there are four of these face-up data cards, and there is a face-down deck. And whenever we have that icon with the asterisk in the middle, that means we can take any face-up data card or the top random one from this deck. If the icon had a question mark on it, then we would have to take a random one from the deck. Now, the asterisk means we can take any of these, and I think this is a great data card for us. So let's draw this and put it into our hand. We started with these two, and it's worth noting you can have any number of data cards in your hand, and this is the case for every single faction in the game. After drawing a face-up data card, we immediately refill the display so that there are always four cards available. After that, we can now perform this effect, which lets us take one favor of our choice. When you look at some of the other options on our board, you can see yellow, red, blue, and green favor, and those happen to be the other faction colors in the game, because obviously we are purple, and we can't gain favor for our own faction. Now, I think for this, we'll take a green favor. And with that in mind, let's focus out. Now, every player has favor cubes in front of them, and non-player characters have their cubes over here in the supply. In this game, we don't have any green factions being controlled by a player, so the cubes are over here, and we can simply take one of these and put it in front of us. Now, if we had decided instead to take a blue favor, it would work the same way. We would simply take one of these and put it in front of us. The player we take it from cannot refuse giving it. It's also worth noting that players have an infinite amount of favor, so if somehow these are all removed, then you can use something else as a proxy. In this case, though, we are going to take a green favor, so we can put that in front of us, and you may be wondering what this is good for. Well, we never spend opposing favor throughout the entire game. We simply accumulate it, and once the game is over, every set of four different favor cubes we have in front of us is going to be worth two points. So as we're going through the game, we're going to try and get even sets of these cubes as we are performing this wide variety of actions. Well, we've finished performing each of these effects, so now let's use another one of our tokens. It's worth noting you can never go to the same location twice, although there is this effect over here that says you can copy one other action that you already did this turn, or you could take one green favor. Now, I think instead of that, let's actually go here with a squire. And that says that we can either discard one of the data cards we have in our hand to gain one resource and one money, or instead we could gain one blue favor. Currently, we have three data cards in our hand, and this is the one that we drew, and I don't think this one is going to be particularly good for us, so let's go ahead and discard that and perform this effect. Discarded data cards can go into a discard pile, and if we ever run out of the deck, we simply shuffle up the discard pile to make a new one. Now, we do get one credit, so we can take that from the supply, and then we also gain one resource of our choice. As you can see, there are three resources in the game, hydrogen, carbon, and titanium, and I think we want to take a carbon for reasons that I'll explain very soon. We can place that right over here, and now we're done with this action, so let's move on and place this squire up there. The effect up here says we can either gain one yellow favor, or we can awaken a building out on the main board. 
In this case, I do think we want to awaken a building. And with that in mind, let's focus out so that we can see the whole board. Now, there are 10 different buildings on the board, and you may have noticed that every one of these data cards has a single building listed on it. Now, in order to awaken a building, we have to play a data card that has a symbol that matches our faction symbol on it. In this case, for our faction, that is a purple diamond, and each of these data cards have a purple diamond. So that means we can potentially awaken this cyber cafe or this vertical farm. This is also part of the reason why we decided to discard this card because it had yellow and blue icons on it, but no purple. So we would not be able to use this to awaken any of the buildings. Now, and the next thing that we do is pay the cost listed at the bottom of the building we want to awaken. For this cyber cafe, that's going to cost us four credits. And for this vertical farm, that will cost two carbon and one titanium. Now, at this point, we have one credit, which is not the four that we need in order to awaken the cyber cafe. But as you can see, we took one carbon and we started the game with one of each of the resources. So that means we now have two carbon as well as one titanium, which is exactly what we need to awaken this vertical farm. So let's go ahead and spend these resources. And now we'll take one of our favorite cubes and place it onto that specific building. Now that cube has to go down onto an empty control slot in the building. As you can see, every building has two of these slots, so we can slide this right over here. And it is worth noting that if there were no empty control spots, we would still be allowed to awaken this building. We simply would not add a new cube down. Now the reason you might want to awaken a building even if you don't put a cube down is because the next thing that we do is gain the benefits down here. This says that this vertical farm will get us five victory points. So if this was full already, we could have still spent the two carbon and one titanium to get those five points. But obviously in this case, it was empty and we got to place a cube down as well. Now I'll explain why it's good to have these cubes here a little bit later on. And for now, let's take our five points and then we can place this card into the discard pile. We started the game with zero points, so that will bring us up to five. All right, that action is done, so we have two more tokens to place. Now, I think we want to place the knight now, and let's actually go right over here. This spot says that we can gain one blue favor, or we could visit a building that has already been awakened. Now, at this point, there's only one building awakened, so we have to choose that one. But I do want to point out that once we have multiple buildings awakened, you are never allowed to visit the same building multiple times within one overall turn. The first thing that we have to do is check to see if any of our opponents have a favorite cube in either of these control spots. For example, let's pretend the blue player had that right over there. Now for every one of the opposing player favor cubes in these control spots, we have to place one of our own favor down onto the building. And the reason for that is because then our opponents are going to gain those favor cubes and they will gain the associated controlling award. So in this example, the blue player would get this purple favor and they would gain one titanium. Now you'll note nothing happens for us. So that means visiting buildings that you have awakened doesn't actually get you this benefit. So in this current moment, we don't actually put any favor cubes down because there are no opposing cubes. But if there was a situation where maybe the blue player had two of their cubes down, then we would in that case have to put two of our favor cubes down because we have to put one per opposing cube and then blue would get both of these and they would get two titanium for that benefit. So as you can see, it's actually great when your opponents visit buildings that you have awakened. For example, at this vertical farm, anyone else who goes here is going to get us one favor of their color and get us a free titanium. Now we are visiting this, so we're not going to gain any specific benefits from this, but we do get to activate the effect of the building. Every building has a main effect and then a faction specific effect. As you can see for the vertical farm, this is associated with the farmer faction. So if the farmer player visited this, they could do the main action option or the secondary. But since we are paladins and we are visiting the vertical farm, our only option is this right over here. Now, every faction is associated with one of these buildings. And for us as the paladin, our specific building is the neon church. Now at the moment, there is one neon church card out on the display, but as you can see, it does not actually have any purple icons. So we could not use this to awaken this building, but maybe one of our opponents will, which would be great because when we visit this building, we would gain this special option down here. At the Neon Church, that says we could take one favor of our choice and we could gain the prestige token. Now, whenever you gain this token, you immediately are going to score one victory point if you took it from somewhere else. Or if you already had it, then you would gain two victory points and you would continue to hold on to this. So just having the prestige token is great because you get one point at the start of your turn and targeting these effects will get even more points out of that token. 
Well, let's come back to the vertical farm because this is where we are visiting, and the effect is simple. It says we can spend one resource to then take three resources, and this can be any mixture of resources. Currently, we have one hydrogen, so we can spend that, and then I think we are going to take three hydrogen back from the supply. All right, we have a single action left, and I think we're going to go right over here with our last squire. This says that we can gain one green favor, or we can complete a quest, and that is what we want to do. At the start of the game, we put a random quest right over here, and the only way to get new quests is by completing the quest that we already have. This one is called Rewild an Abandoned City, and it says we have to spend three hydrogen resources, and then we will gain these benefits. Well, we just gained three hydrogen resources, so let's complete this quest by spending everything that it needs, and then we'll gain the associated benefits. Now, this says we will gain three victory points. So that will bring us up to eight. And then we can advance once on a knowledge track. Now, as you can see, that icon also shows up over here. If we had just put our token on that spot, we could have gained one yellow favor or done this specific action. But I like the idea of completing that quest in order to get this effect and get those points. So let's focus up here to perform this knowledge action. And as you can see, the icon does have all five colors because every time you perform this action, you can increase the knowledge of any faction, not just your own. Now, in order to increase that knowledge, you have to spend money associated with the next column ahead. And in this case, we all currently have zero knowledge, and the next step is going to cost one credit. Well, we happen to have one credit, so we can spend that, and now we have to decide which one of these do we actually push up. Pushing ourselves up is good, because once the game is over, the player with the most knowledge overall is going to get seven points, and second most will get three points, so trying to be high up here is good. However, if you bump somebody else up, you gain the benefactor bonus associated with that area. In the first area of this track, the benefactor bonus is going to be one favor of that associated color. So if we bumped the blue player up on this knowledge track, we would gain one blue favor. Now, in addition to that, we will always get the victory point listed down here, even if we bumped somebody else. So no matter what, we're going to gain this point. And as you can see, the benefactor effects get better as we get farther down. For example, if we pushed blue across that threshold into this area, then every bump in this area will give one favor and you can draw one data card of your choice. So bumping opponents is good, but there are also reasons to have yourself be high on the knowledge track in addition to the getting seven points for having the most at the end of the game. So I think we're going to keep it simple and just bump ourselves. So we're not going to gain any benefactor effect, and we can now take this point. Once again, if we had bumped blue, we would still get this point. The blue player would not get that point. So we go up to nine points, and overall that was a very good first turn. All right, we're done completing this quest, and now we can draw a new quest and simply put it on top of the previous one. You can only ever have one quest available at any time. It looks like the next quest is called Simulcast Message of Hope, and it says if we spend one of each of the resources, we will gain three points, and we can perform a prestige action, which once again scores us points and puts that token in front of us if it happened to not be there already. So that's a new goal for us, and at this point we are now done with a very effective turn. Now that's not too surprising considering we got to do five different things on this first turn, but remember on our second turn of the game we are going to return all of these tokens and only perform the action from where we have knights, and we only have one knight. So we did five actions with our first turn, and we will only do one action in with our second, and it will either be gaining a blue favor or visiting an awakened building. So our super strong first turn will be balanced out by a probably very weak second turn of the game. Now we'll get to that later on, because now that our turn is done, play can move clockwise over to the next player, and that is the blue Couriers faction player. So let's focus over here. Now thematically, the Couriers are the delivery service for the overall city. It's a gigantic worker-owned cooperative of moving hover ships and board riders that deliver things all across the city. Now, the central mechanic for the courier player is pick up and deliver, where they are going to be moving around the city, picking various things up, and then hoping to deliver to complete these contracts, which unlock permanent benefits. Now, on the courier player's turn, the first thing they have to do is check the prestige step. As I mentioned before, if they had the prestige marker, they would now gain one point, but they don't currently have it. This means they can move on to their second step, which is called deploy drones. Now, the courier player is always going to have a stack of three drone tokens somewhere on the board, and these will always start here in the central district. Now, the way their deploy drones step works is they have to pick up the entire stack from where it is and then move it across one of these roads. Now, they've decided they are going to head south, so they're going to go here to the south district. 
And then if they want to, they can immediately perform the ability of that district. The abilities are the top half of this area, and that icon lets them gain a favor from any one of their opponents or non-player factions. After thinking through their options, they are going to take a yellow favor for that action, and then before they move on, they actually get a bonus. As you can see, they have a completed contract down here. At the start of the game, they, they gained one randomly. Now this says whenever they perform an action in the South District, they then may gain one Titanium. They obviously did that action, so they can take the Titanium and add that to their overall supply. Each time they complete new contracts, they can tuck that contract under their board and then gain that ongoing benefit for the rest of the game as well, and I'll explain how they complete these contracts later on. Now they have to continue to deploy their drones. Now at this point, they are actually going to leave one drone behind and then move the stack of two drones across one of these roads. That means technically they could go back up here to the central district, or they could go to either of these two spots. You are never allowed to go back to a spot that already has a drone token. Now they've decided to head east, so they'll go here to the southeast district, and then this effect simply gets them two credits from the supply. After that, they leave a drone behind, and now they have to move, and as you can see, they don't have a choice. They can't go back here because there's already a drone, so they have to go up to the East District, and then the effect there says they can perform up to two knowledge actions. They currently have two credits, so that means they could spend both of these in order to bump two of these up. Now, the Courier is one of the few factions that can actually go up multiple times, in this case, obviously a max of two, whereas most factions just let you move once. Now they have thought about this and they're going to spend one of their two money and save the other one. They have better plans for it, but they do think bumping up one of these is a good idea. So they have spent this and they have decided between these options, they're not going to bump themselves. Instead, they are going to bump the green player. So that means this is going to move forward. And since they bumped somebody else that's not themselves, they will gain that benefactor effect. In this case, that's going to gain them one green favor. And then of course, they do gain one victory point. Well, that's their first point of the game. And with that, they are done with their action because, again, they decided not to spend this other money for another knowledge action. Now, they are also done deploying their drones. So it's time for the pickup and deliver step of their turn. The way this works is they have to select one of these three drones, and then they will either perform the effect on the bottom, or they could complete one of their open contracts in that location, or they can take one money. They're going to start by picking up this drone ship here. Now we can see with their active contracts that one of them is for the central district and one is for the west district. And in order to complete the contract, not only do you have to have the drone ship in that spot, but they also have to have these specific goods. At the moment, the blue player does not have any goods, but they're about to pick some up. Since they're not completing a contract here, that means they could either take one money or they could purchase the thing that's for sale in that district. That is what they're going to do, and the price is variable. This token says they have to spend one resource of their choice as well as one money. Well, they have this one hydrogen they started the game with and one money, so they're going to spend both of those, and then this effect says they will gain two of the green good. So they can take those from the reserve and place them into their supply. After that, the price for the sale is going to change. The way this works is they remove this price token, and then they slide all of these over, and then the one that went out to the right goes right back here. So the price for that is actually cheaper next time. It's only going to be one credit instead of the one credit and one resource. After performing a pickup and deliver action with a drone, they then have to remove it and then stack it on top of one of the other two drones. They've decided to stack it like this because after that, they now must do another pickup and deliver action with the single drone left that is not in a stack. So that means they have to activate this one. And of course, if they had stacked it like this instead, then they'd be forced to activate that one over there. Now they are going to go with this option. And currently, they do not have three credits to buy three hydrogen. They also can't complete a contract here, so they are simply going to gain one money and put that off to the side. Then this will get placed on top of their stack of three. They are now done with their hover ships for this turn, and on their next turn, they will start the deploy drone step from this spot right here. The third step of their turn is done, so now it's time for their fourth and final step. This is an optional bonus, and it says they can discard a data card that matches their current district color. And if they do, they will gain a good of their choice. The district their stack of drone ships in is red. It looks like they will discard this card that has a red icon on it because they are in the red city, and then they will gain one pink good. At this point, the blue player is done with their turn, and we can see that they are one red good away from being able to complete this district over in the west district over there, and it seems probable that that's what they're trying to do on their next turn, and we'll just have to see if they're able to pull that off. Blue is done, so now we can move clockwise to the farmer's faction. 
So let's focus over here. Now thematically, the farmers use the free radicals to grow healthier and more sustainable crops in the world. They are always in search of better processes, genetics, and materials on an eternal cycle of learning how to more efficiently feed the world. Now the core mechanic for the farmer player is placing these domino tiles down into this grid and then activating actions based off of the connected icons. Now we'll see how that works soon, but the first thing they do is a prestige phase. As I've mentioned before, that would get them one point right now if they had that prestige token, but so far nobody has actually taken that yet. So they can move on to the second phase of their turn, which is called farm actions. They can choose one of these three actions, which are build, crystallize, or trade. As you can see, they have three rows on their board, and they are associated with each of these farm actions. Now, the one they choose is not only important for the action itself, but the action they choose will also dictate which of these tiles they will place later on in this turn. After considering their options, they are going to go with trade. This says they can choose one of these three options, where they can spend one credit to get two resources of their choice, one resource to get two new data cards, or one data card to get two credits. After considering these options, they are going to spend this one credit that they started with, and that lets them take two resources. In this case, they will take a carbon as well as a hydrogen. That's finished their trade action, so now it's time for them to plant. They simply take one tile from the row associated with the action that they chose. So they have to choose one of these three tokens, and they are going to take this one. Now they have to place this down into the grid in front of them, and it cannot go over the edge, and it also cannot overlap on top of any other place tiles. In addition to that, it must be placed adjacent to a previous tile on at least one of these edges. After considering their options, they're going to place the farm tile like that. And after that, it's now time for the fourth step of their turn, which is called crop actions. They can perform the associated action for each crop on the tile that they just placed, and they can do that in any order. And there is a connection bonus, where if they place that crop tile orthogonally adjacent to a contiguous group of the same type of crop, then they get to do an action for every additional icon in that group. Now that's a long way of saying that when they activate this rice over here, they will also activate all rice in the collective contiguous group. Since there is one rice next to it, they will activate both of these, and each rice will get them one credit. So that means they will gain two credits. And then the other action available to them is algae. As you can see, it does... As you can see, they currently don't have any other algae next to it, so they are just going to do this once. But for example, if this was placed like that, then they would actually perform three of these algae actions. Now, as I said, they are only going to perform one algae action, and that is associated with visiting awakened buildings. For each algae, they can visit one building, and once again, you can never visit the same building more than once in an overall turn. So they can visit one building. And currently, there's still just one awakened building, which is the one that we awakened on our turn. So they're going to visit the vertical farm. And since there is an opposing favor cube in one of these control spots, the red player has to put one of their favor cubes down for that one. Now, this is great for us because that means we are going to gain this red favor, and we will get this benefit, which will get us one titanium. So let's just take both of these right now, and then the red player can either spend one of their resources to get three other resources, or since the farmer is associated with a vertical farm, they can perform this special action. That is what they've decided to do, and it says they can discard one data card in order to perform a farm action. They currently have two data cards, and they are going to discard this one, which means they once again can either trade, crystallize, or build. Now when they do this, that's not going to place a new crop tile down. Well, we've seen how trade works, but let's look at crystallize and build to figure out which one of these they're actually going to go with. Now, crystallize says they can put one of these crystals down onto a crop tile on their board. So, for example, they could put that crystal right there on top of that rice. And after doing that, in the future, when they activate that specific crop by going adjacent to it with another one of that icon, instead of getting one credit like that normally would do, they could take the prestige token. Now, whenever you take it, you get one victory point, or if you had it already, you would get two. So that means if they had it like this, and then they activated both of these, they could use one to take this and get a point, and then activate the other one to give them two more points, since they would then already have have it. Now whenever you activate the crystals, you aren't activating the bottom, and having credits can be a good thing as well. So once again, they could place a single crystal down for this farm action, but it looks like instead they've decided to go for the build action option. As you can see, that has an awakened building icon on it, so that means they can awaken a building in much the same way that we did on our turn. 
So they have to play a data card that matches at least one of their colors. We can see this one does have a red icon on it, so that means they can awaken the company spire. Now the cost for this is two carbon and one hydrogen, and earlier on using their trade action, they picked up a couple of resources. They did that specifically so that they could afford this awakening. So they can spend these back to the supply, and then they will immediately gain five victory points, and then they'll place one of their favorite cubes down into an open control spot on the company spire. Gaining five points brings them to five, and as you can see, this means that this company is awakened, and for the rest of the game, any player, including the red player, can visit this spot to perform the action. Now, that action is simple. You just get two favor of your choice. They can be the same or different, and that is definitely a good way to make those sets of favor to get endgame victory points. As you can see, the company Spire is also associated with the executive faction, which we haven't seen so far, and I will briefly talk about them near the end of the tutorial. Well, the red player has now finished activating all of their crops, so the final thing they do is refill this spot with a new tile from the top. Now, as you can see, they did a decent amount on their turn, but you can also imagine that as they make larger and larger groups of these actions, they could have more and more impactful actions. The shrimp are associated with increasing knowledge on the board. Soybeans let them draw new data cards, which would probably be a good idea considering they currently don't have any data cards. The fun guy lets them gain a favor of their choice, and then spice lets them gain one resource of their choice. What this means is the farmer starts a little small near the beginning of the game, but near the end of the game, they could do a massive amount of stuff, visiting a ton of buildings, as well as getting a bunch of favor or credits based off of how they've planted their crops. Well, the farmers are done, so play can move clockwise now over to the underground. So let's focus over here. Now thematically, the Underground are a clandestine group sharing the latest findings about the free radical research. They started out as a street art and dance crew and have turned into an expansive and powerful non-profit collective with one shared goal, stopping the status from becoming quo. Now mechanically, the Underground uses a deck improvement mechanism. They have a deck of cards and each one of these is associated with one of the nine different crew members that they have. Now, as normal, at the start of the underground player's turn, they check for prestige. They would get one point if they had that prestige token, but at this point, they don't. This means they can move on to the second step of their turn, which is called actions. Now, at the start of the game, they drew five of these cards randomly from the top of their deck, and now they must use every single one of these cards, playing them out for the actions associated with the different crew members. As always, the first thing they have to do on their turn is check for prestige. They don't have that token, though, so they don't get anything. After that, they have the action phase, and they have to play all of the underground cards that they currently have in their hand, one at a time. They start the game with five of these in their hand, and it looks like the first card they want to play is a hacker. Now, whenever they play one of these cards, they have to choose one action option that's associated with where that upgrade token is for that crew member. In this case, the hacker is at the bottom, and currently they are level one, just like the rest of the crew members. This means they only have one option, which is this, and that lets them take two resources. However, if the hacker had been upgraded to level two, then they could have selected either of these options, and if they were upgraded to level three, they could have selected one of all three of these options when they played that hacker card. Now, obviously this is over here, and now they can take two resources. They've decided to take a carbon as well as a hydrogen. They started the game with a couple of titanium, so they have quite a few resources now. At this point, they have to continue playing cards from their hand, and it looks like the next one they want to play is the Polymath. Now, I do want to mention that whenever they play any non-Polymath card, instead of performing one of these specific actions, they could take one favor that matches the icon of the card. So technically, when they played the Hacker, they did not have to take two resources. They could have instead taken one purple favor, but they also like the idea of having those resources. Now, the only one that doesn't work for is the Polymath. As you can see, they don't have any icon. So when they play the Polymath out, they must perform one of the actions that's been unlocked, when we focus in, the polymath is level 1, and the only option for them is a prestige action. Now, this means they can take the prestige token from wherever it is. Since they just grabbed it, they will then get 1 point. And then, of course, at the start of their next turn, if they still have this, they will gain 1 point. And in the future, if they have this and perform more prestige actions, they will get 2 points. So, that 1 point will bring them up to 1. And then, after that, they're going to play this runner. That could get them one green favor, but instead they are going to gain two credits. They had one credit at the start of the game, so now they have three, and they have two more cards to play. The next one is going to be the Activist. As you can see, the effect of the Activist lets them upgrade one of their characters. After thinking through their options, they're going to use this upgrade a character effect to upgrade their tagger, and then we're not too surprised to see their final card be a tagger. Now that means it's green, so they could take one green favor, or they could perform either of these options because that character is now level 2. 
The left hand option for the tagger would let them visit any awakened building and there are two options for them right now and the level 2 effect says they could perform any level 1 action. After considering their options, they are going to select the activist again. That lets them upgrade one character, and they're just going to upgrade the tagger itself up to the third spot. Now, these characters cannot be upgraded past the third location, and the level three spot for the tagger would let them search their discard pile and then take any card and put it into their hand. Now, they always have to play all the cards in their hand, so that would effectively let them pull a card out from the discard pile that they would then play on that turn, giving them a bunch of flexibility. And speaking of flexibility, they could instead perform either of these effects when they play a tagger. At this point, Yellow has played all of the cards in their hand, so now it's time for the upgrade step of their turn. This says they could spend two credits to upgrade any character from level 1 to level 2, or three credits to upgrade a character from level 2 to level 3. After considering it, they are going to spend two of their credits, and they will upgrade their teacher to level two. Now, a big reason they're doing this is because they can't actually awaken new buildings with all of their crew members at level one. With the teacher being at level two, they can awaken a new building, and if they get a hacker to level three, that is another way that they can awaken new buildings. So this is going to increase the flexibility for what they can do and what they could spend their resources on with their future turns. The final thing they do on their turn is draw, and they are going to draw four cards from the top of the deck. Now that is one less than the five cards they started the game with, which means their first turn is a little bit more powerful than the turns that come afterwards, but of course each of these cards will potentially get more powerful as they upgrade the character ability options. Now if they went to draw cards and they didn't have any left in their deck, then they would shuffle up their discard pile to make a new draw deck. Alright, the underground player is done, which means we can move clockwise back to us. Since our favorite cube is the round marker, that means at the start of our turn we have to move this forward, and that shows that everybody is now entering the second round out of 12 in the game. Now before we move on, I think I'd like to talk a little bit more about what happens once the game is over. Remember, if in this moment we were at the 12th round and we can't go to the 13th, that would be the moment that the game ends. Once the game is over, players could potentially gain extra points based off of these four conditions. The first of these gives 7 points to the player whose knowledge token is farthest to the right. If there is a tie for the furthest, then all of those players get 7. And then 3 points go to the player who is second farthest to the right. If there is a tie for first, then all of those players get 7 points, but then no one gets the second place points. And if there is not a tie for first, but there is a tie for second, then all of those second place players get 3 points. Now, after that, everybody counts the number of favor tokens they have of their opponent's colors. Once again, we score 7 points for the most and 3 points for the least, and the tiebreakers work the same as for the knowledge track. After that, every player will make sets of 4 different favor cubes of their opponent's colors, and for every complete set, they get 2 points. And then finally, we can add together our remaining credits, resources, and data cards, divide that by 3, round down, and then add those points to our total. After that, the player with the most points will be the winner. If there is a tie, then the tied player with the most total credits and data cards will win. If there is still a tie, then the tied player with the most total titanium, hydrogen, and carbon will win. And if there is still a tie, then all those players will share the victory. Well, now that we know how we score at the end of the game, I think let's jump back into the game, and we can now perform our second turn. The first thing we do is check for prestige, but we don't get points since we don't have it. And then the progress step will move our activation cube over. When we do that, we can see this is going to be a remove turn which means we have to remove every one of our squires and knights in any order of our choice. And when we remove a squire, nothing happens, but when we remove a knight, something does happen. So obviously, we don't really care about the order. We have four squires and one knight, so these will all go down and get us nothing. But then this knight will let us either take one blue favor, or we could visit one awakened building. Well, considering our next quest wants us to have one hydrogen, one carbon, and one titanium, and there is a building that could get us all of those, I think we will visit an awakened building. If we went here to the company spire, we would give one favor to the red player, and red would get one titanium, and then we'd get favor, but realistically we want resources. So let's visit the vertical farm. We won't get any benefit for our control cube. But what we can do is give up this one titanium in order to take three resources of our choice. We actually got this titanium because the red player visited the vertical spire on their turn, so I'm pretty happy they did that. Now let's go ahead and take three resources, and in this case we'll take one of each. So that on our next turn we have all of the resources that we need in order to complete this quest, and that will get us three more points, and we can do a prestige action. For the moment though, this knight is going to come back right over here. And then the fourth and final step of our turn is called Promote. Now we didn't do this on our first turn because it says if the activation cube is on a square, then that means we can promote one of our squires to become a knight. 
Our activation cube is indeed on a square, and it does show that knight icon right there. So we can flip a square over, and that means the next time we do a remove action, which will be on our fourth turn of the game, we can perform two actions as we bring these back. All right, that's finished our turn, so now the couriers can go. They don't have the prestige token, so they can move right on to deploying their drones. So that means they can start from the stack, although before they take their turn, I am going to cheat a little bit. On their previous turn, all of these tokens were like this. They purchased these green goods, and they could have placed this there or there, and in retrospect, the southeast is a way better spot. So again, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and we'll just say that that is what they did on their previous turn. Okay, now when they decide to deploy their drones, they are going to start by picking all of them up, and they can move over to the south district. After that, they can gain one favor, and of course, they can gain one titanium because of this permanent effect that they have down here. So they'll gain a titanium, and then they will take one red favor. After that, they can leave one drone behind and fly up to the central district. Now, this effect says they can spend one resource to perform a prestige action, and they have decided to do that. So they can spend this titanium, and then they will gain the prestige token, and that will also get them one victory point. So that brings them up to two. And then finally, they can pick this drone up, and they will head over to the west. That effect says they can draw three contract cards and keep one of them and then discard the others. So they can draw the top three from their deck. And then they've decided to add this contract to their open contracts, and then the other ones can be discarded. All right, that's finished them deploying drones, so now it's time for pickup and deliver. They're going to start right here in the central area, where they only have to spend one money in order to gain two goods of their choice. Now, this is the reason they did not spend that one extra money on their previous turn. And then they'll take a red good as well as a yellow good. After that, this price is going to cycle, so the next time they do that in the center, it's going to cost them two of their resources. After that, they have to stack this on top of one of these other stacks, and they will go down there, which means they have to perform their other pickup and deliver action over here in the west, and they've decided to complete a contract. That's going to be this contract right here. As you can see, that is for the west district, and they need to give up a green, a red, and a pink good in order to do this. So they can put these back into the supply, and then they can tuck this under their board. And it says that for the rest of the game, whenever they perform an action in the West District, they can gain one good of their choice. That seems like a pretty powerful effect, and they are certainly happy to get that going this early in the game. In addition to that, they do get points. I tucked this a little bit early. As you can see, that will get them three victory points. This means they now have five points total. And then, of course, they have to stack this on top of their other stack of drone ships. Finally, their optional bonus lets them discard a data card to get a good of their choice. And they've decided to discard this one. It doesn't have any blue icons, so they could not use it in order to awaken a building. Considering they have a green and yellow good, and this contract needs green, yellow, and pink, I think it makes sense for them to take a pink good. This also means they are a red good away from completing the central district one that says whenever they activate that, they gain one hydrogen, so that's also something they can consider for their future turns. All right, the couriers are done, so now it's time for the farmers to go again. The first thing they do is check prestige, but they do not have that token, so now it's time for them to choose a farm action where they could build into a new building, they could crystallize, or they could trade. Now currently they don't have any data cards, so building is not an option for them. And in fact, if they traded, the only thing they could do is spend one of their credits to get two resources. They'd kind of like to spend a resource to draw a couple data cards, but they don't have any resources in front of them. That being said, they really want to place this crop tile down, so they are going to trade. Now, they will give up one of their credits to take two resources. And in this moment, they're not really sure what resources they want, so they'll just take a hydrogen and a carbon to leave them flexible. After trading, it's now time to plant one of these three tokens, and they are going to plant this one. After thinking about their options, they're going to place it just like that. The reason they're doing this is because on their next turn, they are hoping to place this like that so that they can get a big soybean activation as well as a couple of these spice activations. Now that's for the future though. For the moment, this is simply going to activate and it's going to get them two data cards. It doesn't match up with any other adjacent icons, so that's going to be, so that'll be all of the actions they get there. Another reason they put this here is because in the future, they're hoping to place this like that so that they can match up with an even bigger amount of these soybeans and then also match up with the rice to get more of those credits. So they can go ahead and draw two data cards and they'll take this casino from the face-up display 
huh, and then they'll take this arrow dock. That needs a hydrogen and a carbon, and that just happens to be the resources that they picked up earlier on in the round. They also have a decent way to get a bunch of money from those rice fields, so they figure these might end up being two buildings they can awaken in the future. This needs to be immediately replaced. And then the farmers can finish their turn by drawing another crop tile. All right, it's now time for the underground to take their next turn. After thinking through their options, they are going to start with a hacker. This could get them one purple favor, or they could take two resources, and they are going to take the resources. In this case, they want two carbon, and they now have six resources in front of them, as well as this one credit. After that, they are going to play a teacher. Now, the teacher was upgraded at the end of their previous turn, and with it, they could either take one red favor, or they could take any card from their discard pile and put it on top of their deck, or they could awaken a building. It looks like awakening a building is what they want to do, and in particular, that is going to be the arrow dock. It has a yellow icon, which matches the underground's color, so they are allowed to do this, and that is going to cost them a hydrogen as well as one of their carbon. Now, that is going to get them four victory points, which will bring them up to five, and then they will put a favor cube down onto an open control spot at the arrow dock. When we focus in, the standard effect here lets you spend two credits to take one of each resource, and it's worth noting that if the courier goes over here, then they could instead spend any two goods in order to get four victory points. So, Yellow's Awaken action is done, and they do have two cards left. And one of them happens to be a tagger. Remember, they were able to upgrade their tagger all the way up to level three on their first turn of the game, and that lets them take any card from their discard pile and put it back into their hand. This means they could actually take a card they have already played this turn, and that is indeed what they want to do. They're going to take this teacher and put it back into their hand, and remember, they must play every card in their hand. Well, out of these two, we're not too surprised to see them play this teacher once again, and once again, they will awaken a building. They have just one other data card in their hand, and it also has a yellow, and it looks like they have been building towards getting both of these done this whole game. Now, this costs two titanium and two carbon, which just happens to be exactly what they have, and that will not only awaken the Neon Church, but it will also get them six victory points. Six points will bring them all the way up to 11, and then there is an open control spot over here in the Neon Church, so they can put their favor cube down. Now that is quite interesting for us to see, because again, us as the Paladins have a special action over here at the Neon Church. If we go here, then the yellow player will gain one of our favor, and they will gain a random data card from the deck they cannot take from the face-up area, but then we could spend two hydrogen to get four points, or as the Paladins, we could just gain the prestige token and a point, as well as one favor. So that's a pretty powerful spot, and I think the Underground is hoping that we are interested in going over here, because currently they have no data cards, and that would certainly help them them refill their hand. At this point, it looks like there are four awakened buildings out of the ten now, so when people visit buildings, there are starting to be a lot of different options available. Well, the underground player isn't quite done with their turn. Their final card is their leader. Now, the leader lets them either take a red favor, or they could perform a knowledge action. When we focus in, if they upgraded their leader to the second level, they could give an opponent a data card in order to get two points, and all the way at the top, this would give them points equal to the area of the knowledge track that their knowledge token is in. Currently, their knowledge token is at zero, and they don't have an upgrade option. So realistically, they have to either take that red favor or do a knowledge upgrade, and they do have one money, so they've decided, yeah, they're going to spend this money and perform a knowledge action. They could upgrade somebody else, but they've decided just to upgrade themselves. So again, that one credit will get them one point, and they do not get the benefactor bonus because they moved themselves up. Now, as you can see, the price to move up does increase as you go farther down the track, once you get to the second level, it's going to cost resources as well as credits, and those go up, but the victory points you get for increasing also goes up. So, yellow can gain one more point from that knowledge increase, and now they've played all their cards. The next thing they could do is an upgrade, but they don't have any credits in front of them, so they have to forego this, and the final thing they will do is draw four cards from the top of their deck. With yellow's turn done, that means it would now be time for us to take our next turn, and again, we would advance the round marker to show that we are now starting the third out of 12 rounds. Now, at this point, I'm actually going to stop playing through the game, even though we've only seen two rounds. Now, obviously, we saw one full set with the Paladin as we sent our tokens out and then brought them back, and as we go deeper and deeper into the game, more and more of these will be knights, so when we remove them, we will have more different actions that we can do, and the actual act of putting these out is going to be one that we have to really think about because we have to pay attention to what actions we'll do on the following turn. 
Likewise, over here, we only saw one contract completed for the couriers, but as they complete more and more contracts, the actions they get to do on these various spots will get more potent, and that will enable them to, again, complete more contracts and get more of those points. Up here, we have had four out of these ten buildings be awakened, but I'm sure many more of them would be as the game went on. And looking down here for the farmers, sure, they only have three tokens out, but once again, you can imagine situations where tiles go down and they get a bunch of stuff. For example, that would get them two resources as well as three cards. Then they could also put something like this right there that would get them four money, which would be great for them. And after that, they could place this right here and get five money as well as four data cards. At that point, maybe they're getting too many data cards, but of course they could spend data cards to get more of those credits. And credits are frequently needed to awaken more buildings, which can also give a bunch of points. Uh, in addition to that, they can continue to crystallize. If they are getting too many data cards, they could start putting these down. And then when they activate this, they would simply grab this and get victory points instead of drawing the cards that they didn't need. So once the game gets much closer to the end, as they place these down, they will get to do bigger and more powerful things. For example, if they put this right here, that would let them visit three buildings, and then if they put that right there, they could visit four buildings on that next turn. And when you visit those buildings, you can get quite a bit of benefits, including spending credits to get a variety of resources as well as victory points. Lastly, we've seen a few upgrades over here for the underground, but obviously as the game goes on, they will upgrade more and more, giving them more opportunities to complete their plans based off of the random cards that they drew. So let's now talk about the other six factions. Now, four of them are right out here already. They're just on the backside of these boards. And then the last two are on this green faction board right here. Now, before I actually show you the specifics of the other factions, I do want to point out that every single faction in the game comes with a double-sided player aid. This explains the theme for the faction along with the setup and all of the rules for that faction. So that means you can give each one of these to the players at the start of the game so that everyone can simultaneously learn about how their faction specifically plays. So let's start with the hoteliers. Now thematically, they are the ones who build out the hotels for the massive tourism industry in this metropolis. Now the idea of the hoteliers is they actually customize these hotel rooms for the various clientele that are visiting. Now mechanically, the way they work is they use these polyomino tokens and they're going to place them out into these different hotel rooms. Now on the hotelier's turn, they are going to have to use three of their cards. And at the start of the game, they have five cards face up on the table. If they use a card, then they are simply going to discard it and then they'll find one of the associated token and they can place it down into any of these as long as it's within the bounds and it's not overlapping on another token. After placing into one of these hotels, they then perform one of the two action options that's associated with it. When we focus in, we can see the blue hotel would let them take a favor of any faction, or they could visit any building. The yellow hotel lets them gain a data card or advanced knowledge. The purple hotel lets them gain one resource of their choice or do a prestige action, and the red hotel lets them take one credit, or they could awaken one building. Once again, on the hotelier's turn, they have to use three of their cards. So they could spend this one, and they could add it to the same hotel, or maybe a different one to activate a different action. And then maybe they would use this one and place this right over there like that. Now, every time they use one of these cards, they have another option. Instead of placing the matching token, they could take one of these one size pieces and a two size piece and then place each of these down. But then instead of performing this action, they take one favor of the color of the hotel they just placed that token into. After they use three cards, they will then have to check to see if any of these hotels are complete. Now, they are complete when every single spot in the hotel is full, and when that happens, they remove all of the tokens from that hotel, they can put those back into their supply, and then they'll go up once on this complete hotel track. After they do that, they will gain the associated benefits, and after they've completed many hotels, they'll just start to get more and more points. Now, once the hotel is cleared, obviously they could use these pieces again, and they can start filling that hotel in to perform the associated actions. After checking for complete hotels, they finish their turn by drawing three cards from the top of their deck, but then, optionally, each turn, they could discard one data card, and if they do that, they draw a fourth card. Now, that means they've actually permanently increased their hand size because they always play three of these cards. So, by spending that data card, they will have more card options for them. On the following turn, if they spend another card, they would draw an additional one, so they could keep spending those data cards to have a ton of different polyomino options for them on future turns. Next up, we have the Merchants. This is the flip side of the Hoteliers, so they are also the green faction. Now, thematically, they are the Global Trade Consortium, and they are a bunch of merchants who have seized the opportunity to sell bits and pieces of free radical technology for a profit. Now, mechanically, the way the merchants work is on their turn, they have to move their merchant token to a new market, and every column is a market. After they have moved to a market, 
they then activate every stall that they have in that market. So for example, if they went right here, they would activate this spot, which would let them perform a prestige action. Once they have activated all of the stalls, then they have to perform three actions within that given market. They can track that with these cubes. So for example, they could place this right over here, and that would let them advance on the knowledge track once and then get a credit. They could go right here to visit an awakened building and get a credit, and then they could maybe go here and then give one hydrogen resource to any opponent of their choice and then gain two favor of their choice. After they've performed three actions, they can remove all of these and their turn is done. And on their next turn, they must move to a new column and once again activate all of the stalls there before putting these tokens down. They cannot put a token down onto a stall and they can place new stalls out by activating this action down here where they could spend two credits to place a stall down anywhere on the board. Once again, these stalls are effectively a free action every time you visit that specific market. So while the merchants have three actions on every turn, as they put more of these stalls out, they could combo that into even more actions, and it'll make sense for them to put the stalls down onto the actions they feel they are more than likely to want to do every time they visit that market. Now the merchants only have five of these stalls total, and their gameplay is all about analyzing the markets that they could go to and figuring out the best plan for that specific turn. Next up, we have the Adventurers, and they are the flip side of the Paladin faction that we've already seen. Now, thematically, these Adventurers are playing in World Strike, which is a massive augmented reality video game set in this metropolis. In this video game, players are in control of a variety of Adventurers, like the Cleric, Rogue, Druid, Mage, and Fighter. Now, at the start of the game, the Adventurer board is mostly covered in these face-down tiles with just four face-up, but I've fast-forwarded to the middle so you can see some options. Now, the way the Adventurers work is on their turn, they are going to spend their action points. They cannot save these action points from one round to the next, so it makes sense for them to spend as many of them as they can. On their board, they have a variety of options they could use to spend those points, and the first one to look at is called Move. It costs one action point, and they can spend that by sliding this token down on the track. Then they can move any one of their adventurers not over here in the recon area to one adjacent space, and the adventurers down here are currently at the base. So for example, for that one move, they could take their rogue and move them adjacent over here into this quarry. Whenever an adventurer arrives at a spot that has a scouting token on it, they must remove the scouting token, and then if there are any rows on that spot that match the adventurer, they perform all of those actions. In this case, at the quarry, the rogue is going to let the adventurer player gain two carbon as well as one hydrogen resource. If instead it had been the fighter who arrived over here, then they would perform the prestige action and gain one credit. Now, if they arrived over here with the cleric, they would still remove this scouting token, but then they would do nothing because the cleric does not match either of these highlighted spots. You can only perform these actions when there is a scouting token on it, and these scouting tokens are placed when the tiles are flipped. That means every single one of these tiles will only have the actions potentially performed once per game. So when we glance back out again in this situation, there are only three tiles that they could currently activate. Now fortunately, there are ways for them to reveal more tiles. We'll talk about these actions a little bit more because when we look down at their turn structure, after they are done with actions, they have a recon. Now this has them exchange one of their adventurers who's in the recon spot with any other adventurer. So for example, they could swap with this cleric and they go to those same positions. After that, they would do the reveal step, and it says if any character other than the fighter is over here, then that player can reveal two tiles. After revealing the tiles, they place a scouting token onto each one of them. So in this example, we could see that is a cleric. The mage should actually be over here. The cleric is not a fighter, so that means we could choose to reveal maybe this tile. We can see it matches up with the fighter as well as the mage, which is unfortunate because we were hoping it would match up with the druid since the druid is next to it. But either way, we can still put a scouting token down. And then maybe we could reveal this one. And that one, hmm, that has a cleric on it. That is not a rogue like I was hoping for. But remember, on future turns, we could do a recon action. So perhaps on the next turn, we would leave this rogue here and then recon the rogue like that. The cleric would then take that spot. And then the cleric could go over there and remove the scouting token that was placed in order to perform that action over there at the lake. Now, if you remember from before, I did say if anyone but the fighter is in the recon spot, we could flip two tiles. Now, let's say that the fighter was over there. Well, in that case, we don't actually flip over any tiles, which means we also don't put any more scout tokens down. 
but then at the start of the next action phase, we would actually get five new action points. Normally you only get four, but if the fighter is in the recon spot, you get that fifth action. So the fighter in the recon spot means you're not revealing more options on the board, but you do gain an extra action point for that next turn. Now let's focus out and briefly talk about the other action options the adventurer can do. This top one is warp. They can do it at any time and it does not actually cost them action points. Instead, it costs them a data card. They can reveal that card and then look at the two icons. In this case, that is green and red. And then they can warp, which is going to swap the positions of the green and red characters. So that means they could just do this. And again, they had to spend a data card, but they did not have to spend any action points to do that. After that, there is the favor action. That costs one action point, and it lets the adventurer either gain a favor of the recon color, or if the fighter is at recon, they could gain any favor. The fighter is here, so they could take any of them, whereas if the cleric was on there, that is red, which means the favor action would get them one red favor. Next up, there is the collect action. This is only usable if at least one adventurer is on a tile that shows a crown icon. We can see that shows up in the corner just like that. Currently, none of these adventurers are, but let's just pretend this rogue was over there. Then that says that they could spend one action point to gain one credit or one resource. And it does not matter how many of these adventurers are on crowns, at least one crown will activate this once. After that, there is the Ravel, Defend, and Battle actions, and all of these work the same way as the Crown, where you need to have at least one adventurer on that associated icon. For Revel, they could spend one action point in order to do one knowledge upgrade. For Defend, they would actually draw random data cards from the top of the deck, equal to the number of shields that are showing up in the entire dungeon, not necessarily ones that adventurers are on. Then they could keep one of those data cards and to discard the rest. After that, there is the battle, and as long as you have at least one of your adventurers on one of those monster icons, you could spend one action point and one credit in order to perform a prestige action. Lastly, down at the bottom, they could spend two action points to visit any one building, they could spend two action points to awaken a building, and they could spend two actions to draw any data card of their choice, including those face-up ones on the board. Now, obviously, there are other action options available out here on these tiles. For example, if the cleric went right over here, they would actually gain two action points back. So there's a huge variety of these. In fact, there are this many dungeon tiles that were not even put on the board. So you are going to get a seriously different variety of them every time you control the adventurer's faction. All right, let's now move on to the executives. This is the opposite faction to the farmers that we already saw. And thematically, the executives forecast the future by using free radical algorithms. Now, their control of free radical technology allows them to circulate their holdings in a global network of shell companies that hide the true breadth of their influence. What this means is they are actually going to change where their headquarters is every single turn, and they do that using a Mancala type mechanism. Now, the way the executives work is they are going to start by taking all of these asset tokens from any one of these headquarters spots. They will then place one of them clockwise into each other headquarters until they run out, and then where they run out will be their headquarters for that specific turn. After that, if there was a project at the headquarters that matches all of the assets in that company, then they would complete that project. For example, this one needs a purple, a blue, as well as a green asset in the green company. Currently, they have blue and green, but they don't have purple, so that means this project would not be done, although technically, at the start of the game, none of these projects are out. Completing projects gets them five points, so they definitely want to try and puzzle those out, getting the correct asset color types in each of these to match up with these projects. After checking to see if a project is complete, the next thing that they do is either a commission action at their headquarters or a liquidate action at their headquarters. The commission action has them performing the action in the box associated with that company. And after they do that, if there's no project on that company, they can place a new one. They place that down from these options here. And since right now there's two green and a blue, it probably would make sense to place this over there. And then in the future, if they could get a purple asset into the green company and then also have the green company be their headquarters on a turn, they could complete this for five victory points. Now with this in mind, let's talk a little bit about the different commission options. This commission option lets them visit up to three awakened buildings, and that one lets them awaken up to two buildings in a row. This one simply gets them three credits, and that one will gain them one favor for every single asset token that's currently in the blue company. So if it looked like this, and they did the commission action here, they would get two purple favor, one red favor, and one yellow. Now, whenever they gain red favor, they actually gain a favor of any other color because obviously they are the red faction. 
Lastly, this commission for the Purple Company says they could give one of their red favor to the player that currently has the Prestige token in order to take the Prestige token and score that point as normal, and then they can also give one or two data cards to any players of their choice and then score three points for every data card that they give. Now, the executive player can only give data cards to players where at least one of those icons matches. So if they were to give this, it would have to go to either the green player or the red player. And that's good for that player because they could then use this by definition to awaken a building since it'll match one of their colors. And the executives are happy because they get three points for each of these cards they give away. Now, I did say that they could do a commission action or a liquidation action at their headquarters, and liquidation lets them ignore the commission action, and then they just get everything that shows up on the assets at that company. So if we're back over here at the green company, instead of visiting up to three buildings, they could liquidate, which activates these assets, and that would, in this moment, get them one titanium and two carbon. If they were to liquidate over here, they would get two hydrogen, one credit, as well as one data card of their choice. Now, it's important to note that you can only start a project when you do a commission action. So if you liquidate and there is no project at that company, then nothing actually happens over there. And hopefully you'll be able to do a commission action there later on to get a project out so that you can then try to match that pattern up to get those five points and clear this out. So, as you can see, the executives really have to plan ahead because there is just about no randomness when it comes to their gameplay. Obviously, the more tokens that are stacked up, the farther they are going to move. For example, on a future turn, if they grabbed all of these, they'd have to place all four of them down which means no matter what, their headquarters is going to be the red company. But of course, the order in which they place these down is important. They could put this here, then put a purple one over there to potentially match that project so that they have everything they need. Then they could place maybe this there and that there, knowing that they need a data card perhaps, and they will liquidate to get a data card and one credit instead of commissioning to get those three credits. Now, once again, on the executive's turn, they're going to take all the assets from one area, place those out, then either commission or liquidate, and then finally, they can gain knowledge. Now, specifically, they can only gain knowledge in the color associated with their headquarters. So if we come all the way back to that example turn where the green company was their headquarters, then that means they could only advance green knowledge. Now, they are the red faction, but again, when you advance other factions' knowledge, you gain benefactor rewards. In fact, the executives can gain as much knowledge as they want in that specific color on each of their turns. So if they had enough credits as well as potentially resources, they could perform many of these knowledge actions for that color. And of course, for each one of those, they would gain the benefactor benefit if it's not their color, and they would get those victory points. This does also mean if they activate the red company headquarters, then they could advance in their own knowledge, and of course, they won't get benefactor rewards for that. Next up, let's move on to the Artisans. They are a yellow faction, which means this is the opposite side to the underground. And thematically, the Artisans inspire a whole genre of art using hard light technology from Free Radicals. Now, the mechanics for the Artisans involve using multi-use cards, and in particular, the Artisans don't have any specific components beyond this board because the multi-use cards they use are the data cards that every faction gets to use. On their turn, the artisans are going to perform three craft actions, and with each craft action, they have to take a data card from their hand and then place it out onto one of the five different tools that the artisan can use. So let's talk about all five of these, and we'll begin with the photon circuit. Now, every time they place one of these data cards down, they simply put it next to that tool, and then one of the two icons on that data card will become the active color for that craft action. So this card could have yellow or blue be the active color, and the photon conduit simply says that they gain the active color's hard light construct benefit. Now those hard light benefits are listed right over here, so we could see if they chose yellow, then they could draw any data card of their choice, and if they instead chose blue, then they would gain one titanium resource. Now this card is going to stay there, and in the future, if they want to activate their photon conduit again, they simply stack the new data card on top of the previous one. The next one to discuss is the femtoscope. They can place a data card right up there and once again choose an active color and then they could advance once on the associated factions and knowledge track. Once again, if they advance one of the opposing factions, they will gain the benefactor benefit and of course they get the victory points for it. So that means that this data card would let them advance green or purple. So that means if they want to advance their own knowledge, they would have to place a data card down that shows a yellow icon. Next up, there is the telemonitor. Once they place a data card down, they of course have to choose an active color, and then they could visit any awakened building that matches the active color. 
Moving on, we now have the laser cutter. Now, as you can see, when they put a data card down and choose an active color, it is going to depend if they chose yellow, which is, of course, their faction, or one of the other colors. If they went with yellow as the active color, then that would simply let them draw any data card of their choice. But let's say they instead went with purple. Well, in that case, the laser cutter will allow them to awaken a building. Now, the building they awaken must have a data card associated with it. That data card must have a yellow icon on it like normal, and it also must have an icon that matches the active color. So, for example, if they put this down and chose purple, then they could awaken using any data card that shows purple and yellow. So they could use this one, for example, and awaken the company spire. They, of course, would have to pay the resources as normal, and they'd get the victory points as normal. The last of their tools is the schematic visor. Now, if they place a data card down and choose yellow as the active color, then that will let them do a prestige action, which lets them take the prestige token, and they could spend one credit to take one of any opposing favor color. If instead they chose a different active color, then they will gain one favor of that associated color, and then also they can discard the top two cards from the active colors tool in order to get another favor of that type. So, for example, if they chose red, they would gain one red favor, which would, of course, be this cube from the red faction. And then we can see that red is associated with the photon circuit. There are two cards here, so they could discard these in order to gain yet another red favor. Now, let's pretend they did not do that. And now we've talked about all five of these, so we can move on to the next part of their turn. Remember, they are going to perform three craft actions, which means they're going to place three cards down, even though obviously I put more than three in this example. Now, after they've placed three data cards, the delivery step says they can check the top card of all of their tools. If there are two identical top cards, they can remove those. When we focus out a little bit, we can see in this example, this card exactly matches that one because they have the green and the red icons. So that means the delivery would let them deliver both of these as, I guess, artisanal goods, and then they would get the hard light benefit of green and red. When we look down here, that means they would gain one credit and one carbon. Finally, the artisans finish their turn by drawing three data cards randomly from the top of the deck. So as you can see, they are always going to spend three data cards and then draw three random ones. And the artisans are all about making do with the cards they have in their hand. And they also have this puzzle of trying to match up these identical cards for delivery, as well as them having the puzzle of actually covering up these cards and being able to make these combos happen as they remove some, either through that delivery or, of course, from their schematic visor, which lets them remove the top two cards from the matching colors stack. Well, we've now reached the final faction we'll be talking about, and that is the Entertainers. This is a blue faction, so it is the flip side of the Couriers that we saw already. And thematically, the Entertainers are broadcasting live performances on, near, or about the Free Radicals. Now, this show is called Among the Stars, and it's the most watched reality program in the world. Every week, new contestants are going to compete to win our heart through their amazing talents, abilities, and passions. Now, mechanically, the way the entertainers work is on their turn, they are going to perform actions with four out of five of these entertainers. Now, when they perform an action, they can either do the unique effect of that, which is specific to the type of entertainer they are. So this athlete right here would let them advance one knowledge step of any color, and they would have to pay for it. Or they could visit a building that has been awakened and is controlled by the matching faction color. So for the athlete, they could use them to go to that venue, which would be an awakened building that the green faction has a control cube on. Another option is they could spend this to gain one favor of the associated color, and every time they use one of these performers, they will put them off into a discard pile. So for another example, this singer could let them gain one titanium or one credit, or they could visit an awakened building that has a yellow control cube on it. Now, they do have one other option available to them that is not listed on these cards, and that is that they can discard any two of these in order to awaken a building, and of course they have to discard a card from their hand that has a blue icon, for example, this one right here, and that would let them awaken it. This is the cast tower, which I suppose is a pretty good thematic tie-in. Once again, they have to discard two of these, and it's important to note that they can only activate four out of the five. They must always have one entertainer left. Thematically, this is the entertainer that has actually won the competition because then they are going to take that remaining entertainer and place them onto either the main stage or the backstage into any open slot. After doing that, if there are three performers on that specific stage, then a performance will happen. So obviously with one performer here, that won't happen. But in the future, once some more of them have been placed, 
for example, this actor and maybe this playwright, then the performance will happen. Now, if every single one of the performers on that stage are from the same agency, which means they have the same color, then they will gain the performance bonus. For the red agency that would let them do a prestige action, they could also gain a data card as well as one credit. If even one of these was from a different agency, then they would not gain any performance benefit, but either way, the performance will still happen, and then all of these performers will be sent to the discard pile. When we focus in, we can see the purple bonus will get you one of each resource. The green bonus will let you advance one knowledge for free. They don't have to spend the associated resources, and the yellow bonus will let them take three favor of their choice. After potentially holding a performance, the next thing they do is draw five more contestants for the next turn, which of course is also going to be the next show. And if they don't have any more contestants in their deck, they simply reshuffle up their discard pile to continue to place these out. Now there is one last important thing to talk about with the entertainers, and that has to do with the forecaster unique effect. If we focus in on this card, you can see when you play this, they can predict who will have the prestige token at the start of the entertainer's next turn. They place the prediction card on the player board. Now, as you can see, there are prediction cards right up here, so the entertainer can look at all of these, and if there are any non-player factions, then they will not be here. So, for example, let's say the entertainers think that the green faction is going to have the prestige token at the start of the entertainer's next turn. Well, they would then put this face down in front of them, and the first thing that they do after the prestige step is they check their prediction. So they would flip this up, and if in that moment the green faction did have this prestige marker, then the entertainer's prediction will have come true, and they will gain one point for every opponent they have around the table. So if this was a four-player game, then they would have three opponents, and that correct prediction would get them three victory points. If they are not correct in their prediction, then that's fine. This simply goes back with all of their other prediction cards. So, as you can see, the entertainers are all about tactically making good decisions with the various talent that they get within each of the game's rounds. And of course, they're trying to put together sets of these entertainers to have great performances to gain access to these really good bonuses. And that's it. I've now talked about all 10 of the highly asymmetric factions that come in the game. Now that's going to bring this tutorial to a close, and I do hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Free Radicals, as well as all of these different mini games that are associated with the factions that come in the game. I know that I only played through a couple of the game's rounds, but I hope you got a good idea for what the flow is like for at least four of these factions, and I hope you enjoyed our deep dive on how all of the other factions also worked. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.